And welcome to Everyday Faith Radio. This is Jeff Gaffney, your host for the next 30 minutes. As we talk about faith and the importance of faith in the different areas of our lives, whether today you're in the workplace or a student, an at-home parent, maybe you're recovering from the passing of a loved one, or maybe you're someone who's never really had faith and you're starting to search for what your purpose is, well, the next 30 minutes we interview everyday people who share their everyday faith. We like to start the program with a scripture reading, and I'm reading this from the New Testament. It's uh, from the book of First Peter, chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. And for our Bible nerds, this is coming from the Amplified Version. It goes like this. You younger men of lesser rank and experience, be subject to your elders, seek their counsel, and all of you... Clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Tie on the servant's apron, for God is opposed to the proud, the disdainful, the presumptuous, and he defeats them, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Set aside self-righteous pride so that he may exalt you to a place of honor in his service at the appropriate time. Casting all of your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, and all your concerns once and for all on him. For he cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. Again, that's First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. Cast your care on the Lord. We like to say on this program, If you know Christ as your Savior, but you're going through a difficult or dry time, seek God through his word. God will use it to revive you. If you don't yet know Christ, read the Bible and ask God to reveal himself to you. He will, and you'll never be the same again. You'll be a new creation because there's life-giving power in the word. It brings a person into a living relationship with the living God. On this program, we say read the word, just do it. Again, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. We now have all our podcasts loaded on iTunes if you want to hear the previous programs, or you can also check out our website. It's mark5ministries.com. You can check that out as well. Again, this is Everyday Faith Radio. Jeff Gaffney, your host. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with today's special guest. Please stay with us. We have a special guest with us here from the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Michael Ramsden is with us. He's making a visit to Charlottesville. A special thank you to Peter and Victoria Sorensen for arranging to get Michael into the studio. Michael, I'm a big fan. I've been all over the website, actually taking a couple online classes, so I'm a little bit of a Ravi nerd, but thank you so much for being on the show. Well, no, thank you very much for having me. We like to start this program. It's all about the faith journey. So we'd like it if you could share your faith journey. And then eventually what I'm really interested in is talking about how you came to faith and became an evangelist. That's where mm-hmm. I want to go. But we got to hear about your faith journey. Yeah, sure. Well, I um, was raised in a non-Christian home. And at a very early age, um, I was living in the Middle East. Um, so I was also growing up in a non-Christian culture. Um, uh, initially in uh, the United Arab Emirates in a place called Sharjah. Um, that was in the 70s. A place called Dubai is right next door. But when I was living there, Dubai only had one hotel. And I don't know if you've seen any pictures of Dubai recently. It has a few more yeah. than that right now. Um, and then from there, we moved to Saudi Arabia in the early 80s. And I lived in Riyadh, uh, which is the capital city of the country. Uh, and again, obviously heard nothing about the Christian faith there. Um, Uh, That's just simply not legally permissible. Mm. And it wasn't until my parents relocated uh, to Cyprus for business reasons, with my father still traveling in and out of the Middle East, that I really got to meet Christians for the first time. And uh, they intrigued me. And I had the idea that it would be nice to have a little group of people come together, all my age, you know, and just sort of talk about things. And we asked one of these Christian guys to, you know, give some input to it and to help lead it. And uh, that began to grow. We started inviting more and more of our friends. And then after about six, nine months or so, um, I can remember one day talking with the people who were running this group now, 
uh, and them saying, well, we would love to take you all away, but uh, we can't get permission from the government. And I remember saying, no, I'm sure I can get you that permission. We have a lot of connections. Mm. And I remember going home, talking with my mother, saying, look, I need to get permission to take everyone away on a camp but we need the chief of police to say yes. And he said, no. I said, do you know him? And she said, oh, yeah, I know him very well. Um, you know, when uh, I was young, he invited me on a date, and your Uncle George knocked out his two front teeth and said, if you ever spoke to me again, you'll come back and kill him. <laughs> so she rang him, and so he immediately <laughs> said, oh, I didn't know it was your son. Of course you can go. You know, I, I, I give my permission. He hung up the phone. And then my mother said, what else do you need? I said, well, do you know the minister for interior of the country? She's like, yep, of course. Picked up the phone, <laughs> sorted out everything with him. And then a few weeks after that, we all went off on this camp. I went up a day early to help set it up. And during my time at that camp, I actually became a Christian. So God actually had me plan and organize my own conversion, <laughs> um, which just goes to show he has a sense of humor, if nothing else. <laughs> and um, it's, what happened at that camp was I realized all of a sudden it hit me that I'd come to the conclusion the Christian faith was true. Hmm. But I didn't want it to be true. Mm -hmm. That was my issue. I actually thought that if I became a Christian, my life would be worse than as a non-Christian. Mm. Uh, it would be less interesting, less exciting, uh, less fulfilling, less in every way. But the, ca the way I'm wired, this truth is very important to me. And I thought, I can't deny something which I'm sure is true. I went away off to a mountainside, actually, and I chain smoked my way through 40 cigarettes, <laughs> uh, just thinking, do I really want to do this mm. or not? Um, I had a friend with me at one point, and I just said, I don't think I'm good enough to do this. And they said, you still don't get it. It's not a question of being good enough. It's a question of being forgiven. Mm. And I thought, okay. And I, I, I came off from that mountaintop, quite literally, went to some of my friends who were on the camp, all of them non-Christians, and I said, guys, you need to know something. I'm going to become a Christian this evening, and from now on I won't be enjoying myself anymore. <laughs> and uh, then I left them, and I went and found these guys, and I said, I need you to pray for me. Mm. I want to become a Christian. Mm. So they prayed with me, and the thing that surprised me was I was expecting to feel a very down um, a bit depressed about it, you know, having given up my only shot in life to lead a really exciting, fulfilling life, but now I'll be leading this weird Christian life. Um, I was, you know, to steal a phrase, I was very much surprised by joy. Um, I just couldn't believe how fulfilling it felt, you know, to, to a point of overwhelming, this is overwhelming joy. Um, at that point, I can remember thinking, I don't know how I can explain this really once, so I'm going to keep this secret for a while uh, and not tell anybody. Um, until I know I'm ready to explain it properly. But the, the transformation in my life was so big, everybody who knew me would just take one look at me, and they, could, they would immediately say, well, what's happened to you? you know, you've, you've changed. And so that's then what's just started me on the process of sharing my faith, and I've been doing that ever since. Take me back to, uh, I'm just curious about, um, you, you were intrigued before you even really knew about faith, Mm. And you started this little Christian group or had kind of the itch to start yeah. that. D have you ever pondered that? Like, where did that come from? Well, yeah, I think what it was is I'd been to church a few times. And what I saw there, it was a very formal setting, was dead. Mm -hmm. So I saw the same kind of religion that I'd seen in the Middle East and elsewhere. I'd also traveled as a young child off to Sri Lanka at some point. So I'd seen religion and I'd seen religious people. Mm -hmm. Um and I could understand it was something that people believed and that they did. Um, I never really saw any joy in it, and it didn't seem to change anything fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, they were fundamentally different, and it changed God, but it, didn't, it wasn't big in that kind of way. And then all of a sudden, when I was in Cyprus, I met a few Christian missionaries, and that I could immediately tell there's something different about mm -hmm. you. When you talk about God and what you believe, there's something different. And there was like a life in their eyes that intrigued me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what got me thinking, I want to know what that is. Mm -hmm. So really, one of the ironies is, is when I was up on that mountaintop thinking, I don't want to become a Christian, life will become incredibly boring mm -hmm. and dull. Mm -hmm. I wasn't squaring the circle properly at that point, because actually the thing that got asking me the question in the first place is, what is this life that I can see in you? Mm -hmm. uh, where does that come from? Because mm -hmm. that's what I need. Mm -hmm. I'd had a very privileged upbringing. You know, my, my parents were very successful and, and actually kind. I was from a very wealthy, financially successful family. Um, but the one thing I did know as a result of that, with all of the connections that we had, you know, with all of the success that we had, you know, with all of my family, all of my uncles, aunts, and most of my cousins, all self-made millionaires, many of them multiple times. So the one thing I could see is that it wasn't enough. Mm. And I can remember talking with one of my uncles mm. once, uh, this is before I was a Christian, and he said, what do you want to study at, at school uh, when you're off to college? And I was like, I want to do law. 
And he went, oh, good. He says, we need lawyers in the family. We have so many economists and accountants and business types. We need lawyers too. And I remember looking at him saying, we don't need a lawyer. We need a psychiatrist. <laughs> and that's what we need most of all. <laughs> and it was simply because I could just see, you know, we've got, we've got everything you need, position, money, everything. Mm. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what it was, I, but, and I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm sure this was maybe a God at work in my life. I'd also come to the conclusion that all of my friends were working on the, on the following assumption. Look, our parents and our friends don't know how to enjoy all the money they have. But when I have all of that, I'll know how to have fun. Yeah, that's right. No problem. Yeah, no, it won't be a problem for me. There's something wrong with them, but I'm okay. <laughs> and I can remember thinking, I'm pretty sure that's wrong. Uh -huh. I'm pretty sure there's nothing different, that different about me. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure when I get everything that they have, I'll be feeling the same. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is. So at one level, I knew as I went into that group, um, someone said to me, what's changed? Um, uh, the first the first Bible study I went to and I said well I used to ask the question who am I why am I here and where am I going I wasn't sure who I was or why I'm here but I knew where I was going mm. okay I was going to be a powerful rich lawyer I was going to have a Ferrari I was going to have beautiful homes I was going to have a beautiful wife plus other women as well I mean I, I had the whole <laughs> thing mapped out you know and that's where I was going and I said and I feel like when I became a Christian I don't know where I'm going anymore in that sense mm but I've suddenly discovered out who I am and why I'm here. Mm. Um, but, I, but I think that that was the intrigue for me. It was being in that privileged position of saying, I can see all of this, everything that everyone's running after. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's wrong. It's just not enough. Mm -hmm. And if that's all I'm going to get, I don't think I'll be in any different position to them in a couple of years' time. Uh, and I said, and I think that's what was dr actually driving me all the way through. And so I was I think, trying to think, if I can add this element in whatever they have, maybe that's the solution. Mm -hmm. And I realized it wasn't an addition. It was, a, it was a revolution. It was going to take me in a totally different way altogether. This is Everyday Faith Radio, and we're talking with our special guest, Michael Ramston, today from the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. He's here visiting Charlottesville, and we're heading towards the break, um, Michael. But I am um, I'm wondering, um, the verse that I quoted to start the program, it was something that's been very dear to me. Cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you affectionately and watches over you. Uh, later on in that passage, it talks about how Christ Jesus will complete you. And I'm wondering, based on your kind of faith journey, it seems like you were looking for something to kind of fill the hole mm -hmm. and... You were searching in lots of different directions, but you perhaps found it in Jesus. No, that's that's exactly what happened, and um, it's a very good way of putting it. I think all of us, we're in this world, and we want to be complete. We want to be whole. We're actually looking for integrity. Mm. Um, we, we talk about integrity, and we think about it as an ethical system, but the word integrity means to be integral. It means all of your life somehow joined together mm. into a whole. Mm. And I think most people start out that way when they're young. But as they go through life, they feel that they're compromising and splitting things off, and they have everything but integrity. It mm. feels like they've got this split existence. Mm -hmm. And then we're trying to paper in the cracks and try and make it as complete as we have, but it feels like there's these gaps. But I think what actually happens in Christ is both through the power of the forgiveness that we need mm. to put things right and the fact he can make things new, all of that then knits together in an incredible way. Mm. Now, if you're a Christian and you've, you've lost that, what that basically means is then you feel like you're now living these two different lives mm -hmm. and you've lost it again. Mm -hmm. But that can be put together back by Christ if you're willing to turn back to him. Um, but without Christ, the, the huge problem is, is that you're running on a hedonic treadmill. So we do find some pleasure in this world, but when we repeat it, it delivers less than it did the first time mm -hmm. round. So you have to run harder and faster to get the same level of pleasure. Mm -hmm. But then the next time you have to run harder and faster too. So we're on this hedonic treadmill trying to run faster and faster to remain the same level of pleasure. And we're often exhausting ourselves mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you don't have the financial means to be on the treadmill in the first place, you look at it and think, wouldn't that be great? When you're on the treadmill, eventually you, get, you hit such a speed that things just start to spin out and you think, what on earth is this all about? So we're running after, we're looking for the right thing in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something which is important. So it's, it's what God says in Isaiah 55. He says, why spend your money on what doesn't satisfy your gold and your labor on that which will not fulfill you? God isn't questioning in Isaiah 55 if fulfillment is a good idea. He's questioning where you find it. Mm. And he's saying, why spend your money and your time 
on things that won't deliver. Mm -hmm. Come to me, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Mm, it's a good word. This is Everyday Faith Radio. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back in just a moment with Michael Ramston. Please stay with us. From the Ravi Zacharias International Ministry, Michael, I've been a big fan for a long time, and I'm very grateful for you being on the program. So thanks for being here. And thank you for having me. I need to hear about all of a sudden you... Um, you have a faith conversion, mm. and I want to know what happened between, okay, now I'm a believer, mm. to one day I'm an evangelist mm. going around the world and yeah. telling others about Jesus. And yeah. not only that, with your work in apologetics, defending the faith yeah. in really um, really difficult circumstances. Yeah. Well, I um, as soon as I'd become a Christian, everyone... I realized that would be possible, made possible for me by the fact that I had all these people wanting to answer all these difficult questions I was asking for, mm -hmm. for months and months and months. And it seemed only fair that I gave people the opportunity to ask me what I myself had asked others. So I started there straight away. And right from the very beginning, um, I felt I want to tell other people about this. But as I went, you know, I went off to do a law degree and then I went off to do um, uh, uh, postgraduate work in the field of law and economics. And I was very much at that point thinking, you know what, what I'm going to be doing is I want to go either into business or I want to go into academia and I'll use all the other time I have you know, to tell people. And that's what I did when I was researching, when I was teaching at university, I was involved in, in telling people. The turning point came when uh, Rafi Zacharias got in contact <laughs> with me and he said, look, we're looking to put a, a place in Europe. Are you interested in starting it? And I knew who Ravi was. I'd, I'd listened to him on the radio. I was fascinated by him, loved everything he did and mm -hmm. said. And I started thinking and praying about it. And after about two and a half months, I was actually in Switzerland. I was um, still teaching at university and doing research. And I was talking with a Swiss banker and I was explaining about my research in, in the derivatives world, um, in this, this financial world of derivatives. And he said, you know what, we need believers in this world. Um, most people don't understand it. I don't understand it. He says, and I'm the head of a big bank. Mm -hmm. So why didn't you go and do that? And I thought, you know what, that makes perfect sense. I'll go and do that, and, and, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell Ravi, no, I won't come and work with you. Well, where I was staying was a very famous ski lodge in, uh, in Austria. Uh, the Ford family, various presidential families, they used to bring, they used to go over to this castle, uh, and take it over, they would go skiing mm -hmm. during the day, and then you'd, you'd like thaw out in these incredibly deep baths. Mm -hmm. And so I got into one of these very, very deep baths, filled it with hot water, and as I got in it, I just burst into floods of tears. And all I knew was that morning, even though I hadn't told anybody, mm. that I'd made the single worst decision of my whole life. Mm. Uh, and I cried for one and a half hours nonstop. Um, and I don't know if you've ever cried so much you've run out of tears. Mm. It's actually very painful mm. at that point because uh, there's nothing to come out. Mm. And uh, I remember phoning my wife from there, and she thought someone had died because I was, I was struggling to speak. And I just said, I, I can't say no to this. Mm. And the words, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, took on a totally different meaning wow. for me at that point. And that just goes to show something of God's graciousness. You know, mm. I, I asked mm. for advice for two and a half months. I was, I was seeking him. I was praying mm. about it. And then I made the wrong decision. And then, you know, God very quickly came along and said, why don't you try again? Uh, <laughs> you know, there were two possible answers. <laughs> you get the wrong one. <laughs> and I just knew this is what I had to do. It uh, wasn't, it, I, uh, this is what he wanted me mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And um, and so then that just gave me that marker, and I thought, okay, well, however this works from this point on, that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. Now, Ravi was very wise when I joined the team. He basically said, Michael, we're behind you. We're praying for you. We're going to support you. We're going to give you with an income, but we're not going to make anything happen here. You know, if God is in this, it will grow. Mm -hmm. And I can remember I was about 25 years old at that point, 24, 25. My wife and I, we sat down on the floor um, of a, an upstairs bedroom that had no furniture in it. That was our office. And we started praying, and we both fell about laughing, thinking, how on earth will this work? You know, I mean, no one knows who we are. We've got, you know, I mean, you know, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. So the first meeting I spoke at had like four people in it. <laughs> and, but the person organizing said, oh, that was good. Why don't you we'll, we'll, we'll come and do that again next week? And then there were like 12 people there. And mm -hmm. then the next time there were 50, and there was a visiting guy from somewhere else. And he said, oh, why didn't you come and speak at my thing? And mm -hmm. after about six months, the thing had grown a little bit. And I was sitting at home one day, and a guy called John Stott rang. I don't know if you know who he is. Mm -hmm. He's a very well-known Bible reader, speaker, passed away a few years ago, a huge man of God. And my wife answered the phone and came in, all the color drained in her face, mm -hmm. and she said, John Stott's on the phone. He wants to speak to you. And <laughs> I can remember thinking, I've said something so heretically wrong in one of my little <laughs> meetings. He's ringing me at home to tell me off. Uh, uh, and I went over to the phone uh, and picked up the phone and said, hi. 
And he said, Michael, he said, I'm speaking at a big event in Switzerland in three days' time. The other speaker had a dropout last minute. Is there any way you could come with me? You've been recommended to me. Mm. And mm. I can remember I was terrified. Um, anyway, I went and spoke with him, and I'd been warned that if I said anything he disagreed with, he wouldn't contradict me then and there. But they said, when you go back to the airport, he will say to you, I'm a member of an, an airline club. Why don't we get a cup of coffee? And when you have a cup of coffee, he'll say, you know, a couple of things I'd like to tell you. And that's exactly what happened. I spoke with him for three days, had a wonderful time. Mm. We went, checked in. He says, I'm a member of the club. He gave me a cup of coffee. This is Michael, there's something I need to tell you. And I can remember thinking, and I said, Uncle John, everyone called him Uncle John. <laughs> Anything you want to teach me, I want to learn. And I pulled out a notebook. And he said, Michael, you told the story of George Buttrick in one of your sermons. And George Buttrick was this famous preacher. He, he, uh, he said, uh, after one of his morning ser sermons, a lady came to him and said, Mr. Buttrick, before... You had the most amazing sermon. You must spend so much time with the Lord in prayer when you wake up. And he looked at her and he said, Madam, when I, before I've had five cups of coffee, I'm an atheist. So I <laughs> quoted this story. And then George, John Stott said to me, I knew George Buttrick. He was a close personal friend of mine. And I thought, oh, no, if I just insulted the guys, it's totally <laughs> untrue. He said, and I know the incident to which you refer. And I think you'll find that what he actually said to her was, Madam, before I've had six cups of coffee in the morning, I'm an atheist. <laughs> and, and then I went, okay. And then he said, that's it. And I was like, oh. And then he said, do you mind if I start recommending you as a speaker to other people? And I said, well, Uncle John, that would be very kind. And then mm. the evangelistic opportunities just multiplied up, mm. and it just grew very organically mm. from there. Mm. So the ministry, I think, was very wise. They came behind me. They mm -hmm. supported me. They loved me. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, we don't have to make something happen. If this is what God wants, he's more than capable of doing that. God will provide. He will provide. And, and I think to both in terms of you asking about calling and direction, if, if we're on the wrong path, God can come to us and tell us to change direction because he knows where we live. Mm -hmm. So it's not difficult for him to find us. Mm -hmm. uh, he is more than capable of tracking us down and saying, you know, I think if we're open, even if we're on the wrong path, he will come to us at one point and say, I just need, you need to be going this way. And he'll just keep pushing harder and harder till he gets through to us. I have a question about um, that relates to the movie Chariots of Fire, where one of the main characters talks about his gift and the relationship with God and that he feels with his gift. Mm. When I run, I feel the hand of God or the favor of God. When you preach, yeah. do your evangelist thing, is that what happens to you? Do you feel God's hand on your shoulder? Oh, I think very much so. I think, um, now that's not to say that there, are, there aren't times of discouragement. And I've even known times when I've spoken and thought, gosh, I'm not even sure how well this is going, and then God's blessed it all beyond proportion of what mm. I thought should actually happen. Mm. Um, but I think, by and large, um, I know that if I weren't doing this, and if I were to walk away from it, um, my life wouldn't be better. I, I was about three years into working with Ravi, and my research was very much into this systemic risk idea, this idea that we may see a global financial cr collapse. And in the late 1990s, a group came to me, and they said, Michael, we've seen your research, we're very interested in it, and would like to offer you a job to come work for us. Um, and it pays thirty thousand U.S. dollars a day. Now, back in '99, thirty thousand mm. dollars a day was serious money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went home and I sat down with my wife and I said, "I had a very interesting meeting today at lunch. Mm -hmm. I've been offered a job, and they're going to pay me thirty thousand U.S. a day." Mm. So. We started to pray about it, and we didn't. We prayed for 30 seconds, and it was another one of those times. We often laugh when we pray. We just started laughing again. We literally had tears of <laughs> eyes coming out. Right? And Anne looked at me, and she said, this isn't you, is it? And I said, no, I don't think I'm called to this. Mm. And then she said, do you think you could, like, work for them for two weeks, pay off the mortgage, and then, like, resign? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't think they'll be giving me a paper bag with the cash in at the end of every day saying, here you go, here you go. Um, and... Uh, but again, it was like a marker. It was a thing mm -hmm. where I was thinking, you know what, I could do something different. Mm -hmm. Lord, is that what you want me to do? No. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing wrong with earning that much money, by the way, every day. There's nothing wrong with people working in that field. We need people working mm -hmm. in that field. It's just a question of calling. Right. You know. Uh, I, I, so I, I think for all of your listeners who are listening to about the everyday part, what you're talking about, yes. I think God actually has a call for every believer. Mm -hmm. I think he's powerful enough to actually get most of us into the right place. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between being in the right place and knowing you're in the right mm -hmm. place. If you don't know you're in the right place when things get hard, and they will, the temptation is to get up and walk away. Mm -hmm. And you think by walking away and changing location will change the problem, but actually that doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to therefore know you're in the right place doing the right thing? And I think part of it is, as you say, knowing that sense of affirmation and joy. You know what, when I do this, I'm doing 
that for which I was made and created. And so that's what I should do. Um, and so I think it's hard to wrestle with your calling. Mm-hmm. I think we often wish it was simpler. Mm-hmm. But as we wrestle with it, God's changing us. And we can trust him to eventually get us in the right place. And we need to know it ultimately so that when it is hard, we don't think the solution is to walk away. Mm-hmm. The solution is to say, no, I need to stay here and I need to work this out and figure it through. Mm. Michael Ramsden, it's such a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you for blessing our listeners today. Uh, wondering, because we're literally at the end of the show, but if there was one key promise in the Bible that you keep referring to or you keep coming back to or cycling through your brain, what would that be? You know, when Jesus called the first disciples, he said to them, have you caught any fish? And they said, no. And he said, let down your nets. And they said, well, we've been out fishing at nighttime. That's when you catch them where the waters are deep, that's where they live, and we didn't catch anything. Mm-hmm. So they're basically saying to Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about, mm. but very politely. Mm. Then what happens is Jesus says, let down your nets, and Peter says, very well, Lord, at your word, I'll let down my nets. And for the first time in his life, Peter goes, ca- goes fishing not to catch any fish. Mm. He thinks there aren't any to be caught. The only reason he goes fishing is for no other reason than his Lord told him to. Mm. And he lets down his nets, and there are so many fish, they begin to sink the boat. And Peter's response is, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. And his first conviction of sin happens, not in the temple or not in a sermon, but in the workplace, because that's where the rubber hits the road. And that's all about calling. When you, Jesus has a calling for all of our life. And so that phrase, you know, where very well, Lord, at your word, I'll let down my nets has become a very big thing to me. And I'd ask all of the listeners, when's the last time you went to work on a Monday for no other reason than you knew that's what the Lord has for you? Mm. Because when you know what he has for you, you will find the glory and the excitement of God in the everyday part of your life all the time. And he actually has that for all of us. Mm. Michael Ramston, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. This is Everyday Faith Radio. We'll see you next week. God, we need-